for this week, but we'll be back next week when I will be doing some fairly radical cutting back to stimulate the best possible flowering later on in the season. Joe's going up to Barnsdale to visit Jeff Hamilton's own garden to check up on the show plants for the 40-year garden which we are using at Garner's World Live. And of course, that's just in two weeks now. And Carol will be in the herb garden where she's adding some more unusual herbs. So join us next week at the normal time. Bye-bye. Next tonight, powerful memories of the Falklands War and the horrifying attack on HMS Coventry. Sea of Fire on BBC Two. I'm Damien Hurst, artist, curator, collector, property magnet, I mean magnet, and I want you to watch News Night Review tonight because I'm on it. I'll be talking to Damien about his latest work of art, a diamond encrusted platinum skull at $100 million, the most expensive piece of art by a living artist, and the centrepiece of his new exhibition, Beyond Belief. That's on News Night Review tonight. Every jockey wants to win the derby. It's the biggest flat race in the world. Having reached the milestone of winning it, you want to do it again. There's an amazing amount of tension. It's very quiet. And we're out the stalls and away we went. It was a very rough race. Frank had the toy on the outside and he was knocking me all over the place. I didn't really know I'd won the race. I mean, Frankie hasn't won it yet, which I remind him of all the time. Keep trying. The derby. Will this be Frankie's year? Coverage starts tomorrow at 12.55 on BBC One. Emotional viewing now on BBC Two in a graphic account of the British ship that became an inferno during the Falklands War. Some strong language in Sea of Fire. The Falklands War has reached a climax. Three warships have been sunk and I fear we may be next. I'm the captain of HMS Coventry. We've brought down more enemy aircraft than any other ship. We felt almost invincible until now. Admiral, sending us back there will be suicide. We're under orders to lure enemy aircraft away from our troops in San Carlos Bay. I think we'll be lucky to survive the day. And that's war. You've got to take risks to win. It's like a game of chess, you know, you've got to give up some pieces to get checkmate at the end. That's one of those pieces. received an urgent signal from the Commander-in-Chief ordering Coventry and other ships to break off from present exercises and prepare to proceed south to Ascension Island. We have heard that Argentina has invaded the Falkland Islands in South Georgia and so we shall be part of a task force ready to take any action that may be necessary. I'd never even heard of the Falklands in 82 and um, I can remember sitting down with a few of the lads and you know, wondering why the Argentine did invade the Scotland, really, you know. Stop laughing, you prick. <laughs> I regret that we shall now not be returning to Portsmouth as planned, and that there's no way of knowing how long we shall now be away from. I will keep you informed of any new developments as soon as I hear of them. That is all. What I daren't share with my men is that I have serious doubts that we can win this war. I was on the directing staff at our staff college where we studied various um, likely or possible operations, and one was what happens if the Argentinians threaten to invade the Falklands. It was a paper exercise, it went on for about three days, and we put the students to work 
and we asked him to come up with a solution. Could we or could we not retake the Falklands? And the solution was no, we really couldn't because of the distance from UK, some 8,000 miles. So I feared for um, the Royal Navy and the country that we might lose it. But of course, once the ships are going down now, it's quite difficult to say, bring them back. A mere four days ago, scenes such as this were utterly unthinkable. Even now, it has to be said that there is something almost unreal about them. This is a British fleet putting to sea, not on some training exercise, but sailing with every intention of doing battle with an enemy. Our job will be to defend the task force with anti-aircraft missiles. Along with our sister ships, Sheffield and Glasgow, we will form a shield 20 miles ahead of the fleet. Evening, chaps. Three decks below the bridge is the operations room. It's the nerve center of the ship, where I spend most of my time. In here, my team give me a picture of what's going on outside with radar and sonar, and control the ship's main anti-aircraft weapon, the Sea Dart missile. I wanted to join the Navy since the age of seven. My father was in the Navy, my grandfather was in the Navy, his father was in the Navy. Um, it, it was one of those things where I've always, it's always what I've wanted to do. The missile itself, which is about 12 metres long, has a kinetic energy of a 125 train travelling 100 miles an hour. If it hits you, say goodbye to Vibino. The major threat was the air threat. I mean, they had something like over 200 aircraft. We had 20 Sea Harriers. So very early on, there's no doubt Coventry, Glasgow and Sheffield were going to be extremely busy. And you're quite lonely out in front because you were the first ship to be exposed and likely to be blown out of the water. My darling, if you get this letter, I have slipped quietly beneath the waves and am utterly at peace in the next world. Please try very hard not to be too sad, although I know it will be difficult. Remember, I will always be aware when you're sad, and I will always be trying very hard to make sure you remain happy for the rest of your life. I will always be with you. Be brave. Talk about me and laugh about me. And always remember, I'm still around. All my love, David. At action stations, everyone has to be in their positions, ready to fight within two minutes. As we speed south, we continually practice defending the ship against air attack. Although many of my ship's company are still in their teams, I have every confidence in them. All the communicators were fairly young. We were quite a young little crew. We'd all joined up together, got through training together, and we were drafted as a block. So we'd known each other really from three or four of us since we joined up. So we were quite gung ho about it. Wakey, wakey, fellas. Wakey, wakey. I lived in 3 Delta, which is underneath the 4-5 uh, gun. Must have been about 30 of us in there. But there's never a place you can get on your own. You know, the beds are three high, so there's always somebody near you or around you all the time. I had a tortoise on board of me, a tosh. Uh, he lived in my boot locker underneath my bed. You know what I mean? He'd come on the upper deck every so often. Um, obviously, we had to keep him away from such certain people. Not everybody knew we had him on board. I was 19 when I first joined the ship. I mean, we'd just been to Gibraltar, fantastic, you know. Loads of pubs. It was a good, uh, it was a good trip. 
I mean, despite the fact that I was married, I was probably quite carefree in the sense that, uh, you know, I was 19, just enjoyed life. <laughs> I was 18 on the way down, and I did have a couple more than two tins that night. We got quite insular with our own ship's company. You know, we were getting like a family, really. My darling, the loneliness of command, especially at difficult times, it's quite a strain. Though I know I shall cope all right. I'm outwardly cheerful, though inwardly anxious. I long to get back and miss you a lot. Uh, chips and peas, sir. Uh, yes. P.S. While I remember, there are two letters in the drawers of my desk addressed to you. They tell you how much money you'll get in case I fail to return from the war. Thought I'd better mention it. At least you won't be short of cash. I must tell the house. and no invasion can alter that simple fact. It is a government's objective to see that the islands are free from occupation and are returned to British administration at the earliest possible moment. Part of the preparations for war is getting the ship absolutely fit and ready, which means getting rid of some of the things you carried around in peacetime. So they had to go over the side because you couldn't uh, have them impeding movement around the ship or indeed as a fire hazard. And I had on board all the trappings of peacetime and entertaining, so I had all my best uniforms, clothes, and I had a certain amount of silver on board, my sword, my telescope. So I must admit, I did think of actually trying to get rid of this and landing it or transferring it to a ship which is more likely to survive than perhaps I would. But I soon realized that if the ship's company saw, you know, a package of the commanding officer's goodies going across to another ship, that would be bad for morale. But no, there's no way I could do that. I was caught. It now looks certain that Argentina will fight to the very end to try to retain the Falklands. During the last few days, there's been speculation here that President Galtieri might be persuaded to enter last-minute negotiations and at least stave off the major bloodbath. 2,000 miles north of the Falklands, Admiral Woodward drops in to brief the ship's company. Gentlemen, the Admiral. Morning, gentlemen. Relax, please. It seems almost certain now that we shall be going to war. Diplomatic negotiations have almost ground to a halt, and the Argentines show no sign of compromising. They're certainly making no moves to get out of South Georgia and the Falkland Islands, so we are going to have to get them out. Make no mistake, this is going to be a tough war, and we can't expect ship losses. We might as well face that now, and also face the fact that some of you may not be returning home. Admiral Woodward came on board. Um, I think his intention was to give us a pep talk. And in my view, he singularly failed. His words went along the lines of, we're going to war, we're gonna get fired at. And some of you people stood here listening to me right now aren't going home. You do have to accept that. Some of you will die. And I stood there and I thought, some bloody pep talk this is. But you must now make very thorough preparation for war. The whole country will be watching this closely and expects nothing short of total victory. I wish you all good luck and Godspeed. Thank you. Go.
and off he went and everybody's chin was just hitting the deck. It actually got some of the younger people quite concerned. Um, and in the engineer's workshop, it was, it was extremely busy for a couple of days after that because everybody was spending their time putting their names, their service number and their blood group on little brown discs called dog tags because they thought we we're all going to die. Everybody had to write a will, and I remember, I do remember thinking at the time, says, well, this is really getting serious, but we'll just do this, it's obviously a formality. But at, at that age, in my early 20s, it was, a, writing a will wasn't something that was first and foremost in my mind, or indeed those that were a lot younger than myself. Not to put too much a finer point on it, I had a, a reservation about filling in a will. So did my friend Phil Fisher. And Phil said to me, I'm not going to fill a will in because I'm not going to die. And Phil, I said, well, I agree with you, nor am I. Let's be positive about this. Five people round the table in the Chiefs Mess signed a will and never made it. You could certainly feel the responsibility of Evening. taking Evening. nearly 300 Sir. sailors to war. People began to look at you more closely and listen to what you had to say. And so I had to remain outwardly strong and cheerful which I did. In fact, I was sort of buoyed up by them in a way. I couldn't let them down. But I could feel uh, the weight um, of their lives being in my hands. Winter has arrived, and war may not be long in coming. We're well advanced into the roaring forties, the winds that storm up from the direction of the Falkland Islands themselves. We're almost within strike distance of the islands, and we're certainly within range of Argentinian aircraft. Every passing mile brings the conflict closer. I have a terrible hollow feeling in my stomach as the full realisation of what is happening dawns on me. With it comes a sense of being trapped, no possible escape, and of being pushed into a fight of someone else's making, a lottery of life and death. At approximately 8 o'clock London time last night, the Argentinian cruiser, General Belgrano, was hit by torpedoes fired from a British submarine. The cruiser posed a significant threat to the British task force, maintaining the total exclusion zone. There was no cheering. There was no people slapping each other on the back, well done, the war started, let's get on with it, and that sort of thing. It was a case of thinking of the, of, of the sailors, really. Um, there was a there's, a... there's a form of worldwide camaraderie among sailors. Um, yes, you're at war. Yes, you've got to shoot each other. Yes, you've got to make sure that they sink and you don't. But uh, we don't take pleasure in that. Darling Daddy, I dreamt that you came back in the middle of the night and bought some presents. One was a typewriter for Miranda, and one was a puppet for me. And for Mummy, a lovely plant. I hope you come back soon. Much love, Alice, your lovely daughter. Well, the weapon that worried us most was the Exocet, which is um, a sea-skimming supersonic missile. And once it's locked on, there's no way you can stop it. The 
notification alarm went off when I was actually trying to get some sleep. I was in the mess, on the top bunk, and the alarm went off and I just couldn't get off my car and get my gear on fast enough. So by the time I'd sorted my life out, the, the Zulu door outside the PO's mess was, was shut. And the rules are you don't open it. So if you're stuck, you're stuck. First thing you do is to put chaff into the air, which throws out a pattern of force echoes around your ship, uh, which hopefully seduces the missile to the force echoes and not to your ship. I, I picked up the phone and I rang the office and I, I just said to it, it's so matter of fact, everything okay, Mac? Yep, everything's fine, Pots. Well, um, you know we're stuck in the mess. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway, you keep your head down, take care, okay? Yeah, you too, Okay. And that was it, basically. It's matter of fact stuff. You got this impression that's sort of deep, deep in your head that this is a nasty piece of work that's coming towards you. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it. You're probably in the worst place you can possibly be. And you say, cheerio. You, you tell everybody to take care. You tell your mum and dad you love them. And then afterwards, when, when it's all over, you feel so bloody stupid. All morning, we've been getting false contacts on our radar. We maintain constant communication with our sister ships to assess the threat. Glasgow is still convinced an attack is imminent. Coventry and Sheffield, this is Glasgow. We're holding a passive radar contact. We will maintain air warning red and suggest you do likewise. And I remember Sheffield being less certain about whether there was a threat or not. A lot of talk is still going on. We didn't know where the threat was coming from. Sheffield! Sheffield! And suddenly there was silence from Sheffield. Conversation stopped. And I just couldn't believe it. And I thought there must be a communication failure. Sudden, ominous, horrible silence from Sheffield. In the course of its duties, Within the total exclusion zone around the Falkland Islands, HMS Sheffield, a Type 42 destroyer, was attacked and hit late this afternoon by an Argentine missile. The ship caught fire, which spread out of control. It is feared that there have been a number of casualties, but we have no details of them yet. Next of kin will be informed first as soon as details are received. We went onto the upper deck and we could see the Sheffield burning from about 11 to 12 miles. We could certainly see the smoke on the horizon there where Sheffield was burning. It struck home, the Sheffield the fact that we weren't as good as perhaps we thought we were. I remember seeing the Sheffield standing out on the flight deck. Um, not close enough to see it in detail, but we could see the smoke uh, coming from it. And even at that point, I still didn't even think or worry or think, oh, God, you know, we're, we're actually, this is quite serious. Never once, not even at that stage. Type 42 community was, even then, an incredibly close community. 
we all knew each other. You know people in the ships and, uh, and you know something nasty has happened. Uh, so your immediate concern is who's it happened to? From my point of view, I'd only recently left the Sheffield. All the communications guys on the Sheffield I knew. I, I guess my, my, my heart was in my mouth for, for a while and um, Doc Savage, he had just come off the chef as well and we just sat in the, my office and cried. Openly, and I don't, don't mind admitting it, I just felt so bad. And it was a bit of a shock I think when we found out that upwards of 20 had died. It's quite sad but God, proud to have known him. Daddy, I'm doing something called cycling proficiency. It is learning how to cycle on the roads and you have a test. There is a writing test which I passed and a cycling test which is on the 10th of May. I haven't done it yet because it's the 8th of May. It is very sad that Sheffield sank. Lots of love, Miranda. P.S. I have got some new shoes. There did come a point where I did find letters distracting. I was very keen to get a last letter saying everything was well at home, children were all right. And then I wanted to forget home, put it behind me on a sort of happy note. I had to put photographs away of family and Dee. I found that a distraction because you really have to concentrate on the people you know, you're leading uh, and the matters in hand. <laughs> we had a movie on board The Life of Brian. They came in about two or three reels on a 35 mil projector. And um, every time it got to just about ready to load the last reel, something went wrong. Our radar has detected enemy aircraft coming into missile range. At last, our chance to show what we can do. We had, I believe, two Skyhawks way out to the west that were being tracked in. We locked them up at 65 to 70 miles. It's going to be the first time a CDR was going to be fired in anger. So I was quite excited um, by that, and so were the ship, and certainly so was Captain Hard Day. Bird of hostile track 1211. Hostile 1211, bird target. We're just listening to what's going on out there. I've got fighter control on one speaker, I've got I've got the, the internal systems on another loudspeaker. We're, we're just listening to the whole thing. 50 people doing the different things at exactly the same time. Engage hostile 1211 with CDOT. We just get birds away and you hear the sea dart missile go. It's like a it's like a big hollow metallic <laughs> and it leaves this metallic echo behind it and the, the whole ship. Blind visual, blind. This is visual. That's a confirmed sea dart kill. Yeah. Uniform. Hostiles flashed by birds. Well done, chaps. So the Coventry was the first vessel to fire a sea dart in anger and claim a kill. <laughs> it's a very strange, a very strange feeling that you're actually jumping up and down and saying, oh, well done, lads, uh, it's, some, somebody's died. <laughs> Hostile 
here we're quite cocooned, if you like, in, in this little uh, centre here, although we, we know what's going on. You don't think who is behind that blip on the radar screen is actually a person with a mother and a father and uh, maybe a wife and children as well. You can't think that way. Uh, it is someone who's trying to kill you and you don't want that to happen. Our crew is maintaining a grueling routine intercepting enemy aircraft. Sea Dart is proving a formidable weapon. And our Lynx helicopter has just fired the untried Sea Skewer missile. Should be impact any minute now. On its maiden launch, it sunk an enemy patrol boat. Another score for Sam McFarlane's door. One became very steely, totally uncompromising. And you have no feeling for the enemy. There's, there's no pity, sorrow, forgiveness at that time. Uh, you become a pretty angry, aggressive sort of individual. And I was quite surprised, e even myself, how I discarded all peacetime thinking and inhibition. You know, rules and regulations became irrelevant. You were totally focused on getting at the enemy and surviving. The Argentinian pilots are getting bolder with their bombing runs. They've just crippled our sister ship, Glasgow. This leaves the task force with just one Type 42, Coventry. We now have to shoulder the workload of three ships and we're beginning to feel the strain. Even at 19, I was knackered. You know, we, we were either, you know, four on four off, four on four off, six on six off, six off. And some of those times when you'd go and get your head down, you know, you might be halfway through that sleep and you go to action stations. So you miss that sleep and then you're on watch again. And so, you know, after the length of time we do that for, you know, you, you, you get very, very tired. And I remember being in the torpedo magazine and um, oh, God knows why, but we had some bubble wrap in there. I was just so tired, I laid on the floor in there. I thought, so I've just got to, I've got to get some sleep. And the next thing I know, and I thought, oh, you know what? Hung drawn a quarter and I can't get up, I'm just too tired. And I remember John Kelly stuck his head around the corner and saw me and I thought, oh, you know, and he shut the door and he turned the wheel. And, you know, that's the sort of guy he was. He knew that we're all tired. For those of us in supervisory positions, which included myself, I would be working 20, 20 plus hours a day. I spent most of my time living in this operations room in, or in my office next door. I very rarely got to bed for many days at a time. Well, I think it's morale, people's morale, that actually makes them endure and show courage in times of fatigue and danger. And I think that's what kept the ship's company going. It was remarkable how they withstood the pressure and the strains. British forces have now established a firm bridgehead on the Falkland Islands. Royal Marine Commandos and the Parachute Regiment are now ashore in substantial numbers. As we expected, our ships have come under heavy air attack. Five have been damaged, two seriously. We are at a crucial stage in the war. Coventry has been given the vital role of preventing enemy aircraft from bombing our support ships in Falkland Sound. If we fail, the war could be lost. It's going to be a hard and busy time, and we shall be very much in the firing line. But the worst may soon be over, and Portsmouth can't be too far away. That is all. What I don't want to broadcast is how vulnerable we are in our new position closer to the islands. 
Our long-range missiles work best over open sea and cannot cope with surprise attacks from low-flying aircraft coming in over land. We'll be paired with HMS Broadsword, who will try to protect us with her close-range Seawolf missiles. But I'd prefer to be in control of my own destiny. Good evening, Admiral. Admiral, sending us back there will be suicide. We have a damn good ship, and, and this, is, this is a huge risk. Yes, sir, but to be effective, we have to be further out. I do have vivid memories of the captain talking on secure voice to the Admiral on numerous occasions. Several nights running, the captain asked, could we move further out to sea where we could better defend ourselves and still tell the air picture, the long range air picture, um, to, the, to the task group. And on several occasions, unfortunately, that permission was denied. He said, stay where you are, and he kept sending me back to the same spot. And I realized why we were doing it. If necessary, we were the sacrifice, uh, rather than other ships which are more important. And that's war. You've got to take risks to win. It's like a game of chess, you know, you've got to um, give up some pieces to get checkmate at the end. That's one of those pieces. The 24th of May was a good day. The ships of the Sion shot down a number of airplanes and the Sea Harriers too. And I felt that, you know, the end of the, the war was probably in sight. After the watch, Captain, just about to turn in. Call me if you need me. But nevertheless, the next day, the 25th of May, was their national day. Emotions would be running high among the Argentinians. So we were expecting the 25th to be a pretty active day. And I personally felt that if we survived the 25th, we would have survived the war. It was going to be a difficult day. It couldn't be a worse start to the day. We've intercepted an ominous sounding radio transmission from an Argentinian Skyhawk. We knew we had been spotted, our position had been reported back to Argentina. We knew they were planning to come and attack us and broadsword. So it was very uncomfortable, but I suppose it had been a long time coming. But you still don't believe, you know, it's going to happen to you. You know, I think the longer you survive, particularly when others hadn't, you begin to think you're going to survive. I detected a number of aircraft about 100 miles out to the west of the Falklands. When they made their landfall on the Falkland Islands, they flew very low among the folds and the contours of the hills, and we lost them completely on radar. Four aircraft sprang out from the land and came herring towards us about 12 miles to the south. And it was two sets of two Skyhawks, so therefore we decided then to fight the battle with our sea dart. We then lost lock because they were too low because of the land mass that was behind the aircraft. The health broadsword. I think we're on our own, sir. Broadsword had the aircraft in her missile sights with Seawolf, but Seawolf had a technical hitch and didn't engage. So she wasn't able to shoot those aeroplanes down. Alarm aircraft! Red 7 Engage with four flight guns. Four, five, engage. Shoot! I was 
was actually sitting in the Torpedo magazine at the time. And I was looking through a NAFI catalogue. And uh, at the age of 19, I was looking at a lawnmower in this catalogue, thinking, God, all the money I've saved, I, could, I can buy one of those and cut my grass when I get home. That's fantastic. At which point, the, the hatch came open. Pete! Pete, we've been attacked! We're under attack! I went, oh, right, OK, I said, oh, I'll grab my camera and get some action snaps. You know, which is the most bizarre thing. And I walked around the corner and... Fucking hell! At that point, my war started. I've never been so scared in my whole life, and I hope to God I'm never, ever that scared again. Two bombs were delivered to Broadsword. One missed, the other one hit the sea and bounced up through her quarter deck, destroyed a helicopter, went over the side, and exploded harmlessly in the sea. Sir, bird to firm, hostile, one, two, one, one. Bono nine, contact to firm. Then shoot the damn thing. Seconds later, the second pair came towards me. Ten miles. Nine. We tried to engage with CDAR, achieved lock very, very briefly, fired my missile, but broke lock, and it went straight up in the air. Bird miss, bird miss. Eight miles. Four, five, engage. Shoot! Seven miles. All up a deck weapon, stand to and fire at will. My boss ordered me over the broadcast to switch on th this light and blind the pilots. Obviously, I've seen the war films before where they shoot the person with the searchlight, so I told him in no uncertain terms that I wouldn't do it. Fuck off! I can remember the person screaming down the microphone at me to switch the light on and blind them, and I told him to fuck off again. <laughs> Having heard the 4-5 guns start to go, and I thought to myself, they're actually throwing everything they can. And then I heard machine guns. And I thought to myself, CDAR didn't work, 4-5 gun didn't work, machine guns, everybody on the deck. Go, go. then heard two thumps. It wasn't bangs, it was thumps, which now would appear to be the two 1,000-pounders penetrating the, the port side of the ship. There was like a pregnant pause for a few seconds while people were taking stock. Suddenly there's nothing else we could do. And there's a terrible hush in the ops room. And that seemed to last for a long time. Nobby Northeast and a couple of the others were actually just sat on the deck with their backs against the CCX. And I said, Hey, I told you to hit the bloody deck! slowed down. Everything seemed rational. Everything seemed okay. I was no fear whatsoever. No worry. It was almost like someone had given me a day pass for a, 
a film they were shooting on a, a war scene. The first thing I remember then was a terrific blast and heat, searing heat. I remember seeing total chaos and devastation in this compartment. People on fire. The, the bomb exploded in a computer room. And the next thing I know is just this, this silence and the, the flash and the fireball rolling around the operations room searching for the oxygen. The ops room imploded. The screen itself here seemed, to, in my eyes, seemed to melt in front of me. My arm was alight. Literally, my skin was alight, and I was putting my arm out with my left hand. I tasted the rubber and the wire going down your throat into your lungs, because you're actually sucking in all the remnants of, of burning wires and equipment. I knew the computer room was on fire. I heard the guys in, in the computer room being burnt, burnt to death. Someone help me! Please! Please! Help One of them was still trying to get out of the computer room. And I actually uh, did crawl over to try and pull him up. The screams will never leave me. The smoke was thickening the ops room and I was suffocating and I was trapped. But I was quite rational, quite calm. But I saw no alternative but to die. You know, it's not the sort of situation you've been in before. And I was surprised how calm I was about it. I actually was wondering slightly who was going to mow the lawn at home in my absence. But then suddenly, I found myself out of the starboard passage in clearer air. How I got there from one minute dying, suffocating, in the middle of the ops room, to being out there, I don't know. But eventually, I came to my senses much more. I felt the whole ship lurch to port. as an awful feeling that the ship was doomed. You knew it was a death throes of a ship. It was a, a movement you've never felt before of a ship at sea. I made my way to the starboard passage, and I realized then that I only had a pair of boots on with certainly a pair of nicks, and a piece of collar of my number eight shirt was still attached. My anti-flash and everything was completely blown away, apart from my wedding ring and, and my St. Christopher, which I still wear today. The next person I saw was Sam McFarlane, my old partner in crime. Chris and I were, were soulmates. We were on the same frequency. We just, we just hit it off from the very first time we met. Jesus Christ. There were cables sort of dangling and going <laughs> And I just had to get Chris past him. And I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to deal with this? So I got hold of him and I took him to the bottom of the what was. What was a bloody staircase. And the steps had gone and I thought, oh shit. But everybody else was, was scrambling up at the wall. And I just manhandled, kicked, cajoled, shouted at, loved him to bits, cuddled him, got Chris up to the next level. Paddy Burke was the first aider trying to help and, and he just looked at me and he said, I need some water. And I, I had a, a blue plastic mug that held about a pint of tea. And, and I, I went back down. <laughs> I went into the officer's bathroom. Oh, 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 
on and nothing was coming out. So that's okay, I'll flush the toilet. Any water's better than no water. Oh, come on! Come on. And there's no water at all. Oh, come on! Come on! And I was desperately trying to get this plastic mug down the pan so I could get some water for Chris. And I was absolutely pissed off that um, I was going to let my mate down because I couldn't get water for him. Every time I came to action, I always brought Tosh the tortoise with me, and uh, this is the one time he didn't come, and uh, he was still locked in my boot locker. I did think of going down to get him, but when I opened the door and it was just smoke, there was no way I could go back down four or five decks to try and find him. Good job! Come on! In the fresh air, I could feel that. I was burnt and I was hurting. Adrenaline kicks in, it was very painful. I didn't know my back was stripped of skin then down to several layers, so it wasn't a thought, it was just survival. I inflated my life jacket when I was in training. And they always drilled it into you that if you overinflate it, when you hit the water, you'll break your neck. If you underinflate it, you'll go down so deep that you won't get to the surface. So you put a bit more air and you say, well, hang on a minute, that's probably going to break my neck. So you let some air out and you think, shit, that's not enough. Puff, 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 try and get some more air in. And in the end, I just thought, enough's enough. I guess the next thing I saw was just air bubbles going up and I was still going down. And I thought to myself, you stupid bastard, you took too much air out of your bloody life jacket. I wasn't going to give up, but I thought, what can I do? I seemed to be going down at such a rate of knots that there's nothing I was going to be able to do. And then suddenly, the, the bubbles were going in the other direction. And I thought, yeah, this is good. This is really good. And then, woof, just shot out like a bloody rocket. I didn't do my top of my once only suit up. Subsequently, the whole of my once only suit was filled with the South Atlantic, which was a good thing, because it then blanched my burns. It doused the heat with my burns on my back. I never gave the order to abandon ship. It was actually the only thing to do. And what was remarkable was the normal decision makers, the sort of senior people, were incapacitated. The optional crew and myself, I was in no position to give orders. So the decisions to abandon ship to get all the life rafts in the water were made by the younger members of the ship's company. Everyone was calm, everyone was helping each other put on their life jackets, their survival suits. And I watched this almost spellbound. I was in no hurry to leave the ship, but it was turning over very rapidly. Inside the life craft, there's um, canisters with water, cigarettes, uh, which you're not meant to open for the first 24 hours. And I think within three minutes that they've been opened, and we we're eating chocolate and smoking cigarettes. Fuck me! There's there's fags in the ration packs. Now I'd given up the three months. 
Cigarettes. Ah, sod to give up smoking. I'm starting again. But life rafts were, were pretty full. I could see them off the ship. And some sailors and some of the life rafts were shouting, come on to me, skipper. It's time for you to leave. That was probably the last to leave. I actually walked down the ship's side, which by that time was almost horizontal, and jumped the last two feet into the water. When you leave a ship, I guess you leave a part of you with it. Love her or hate her, she's been your home for X years, X months or whatever. She's been good to you, she's bloody let you down, but you still love her to bits. And um, looking back as I was leaving, I just couldn't believe that this is my life and, and I've got to leave it. And then suddenly somebody went, first out and taken to Broadsword. And then I sat in the cabin having a cup of tea. And then an officer came into the cabin whilst I was sitting there, and he said, would you like to see your ship? And there I saw the ship, uh, upside down, its keel horizontal, just a few feet above the water. And probably less than half an hour before, that ship had been a fully fighting, efficient, happy ship. And now it was gone. And that was the last I saw of the ship. Time with haste to wear my 